Um, so my name is Bing Zhang. I'm a professor of molecular and human genetics in the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, in the United States. Uh, so I'm a PI of a lab of about 10 people. Um, so our focus is on computational biology with application to uh, studying cancer. Um, so my lab is supported by funding primarily from the National Institute of Health and we are currently applying integrative bioinformatics methods to the understanding of cancer and try to figure out better ways to treat cancer. I think there are probably two aspects of this. First, I think people have to understand the need, so why we need to do the integration. I think there should be some demonstration project uh, to demonstrate that there is a value to integrate the data. And I think some of the government effort, for example, the CPTEC effort in the US is doing something like this to try to bring people together and uh, demonstrating the value of by integrating genomic and proteomic data, for example, we can learn something that we won't be able to learn by looking at the data separately. I think then we can get some papers published, for example, and then people will appreciate the value of this. And the second part is, I mean, even if you want to integrate, you need to have the ability to integrate the data, right? I think currently this is through integration, uh, interaction between uh, scientists with different type, um, types of expertise. But I think in the future, we also need to think about education. Uh, our next generation scientists should be able to uh, at least understand both genomic data, proteomics data, etc., and also can understand the computational part and the experimental part so that they have a holistic view of the biology and then they can do a much better job than what we can do today. Well, um, I think basically these are basic technologies and the whole genome sequencing technology is trying to um, study the DNA sequences and the transcriptomic sequencing are trying to study the transcribed mRNAs. Uh, I would rather also throw in the proteomics part which will study the protein which is a translated product of the genes. Um, People sometimes ask me, I mean, which one is a better technology, which one do you like? Uh, to me, I think a better way is to integrate all these technologies. Uh, again, I mean, we want to gain a holistic, a holistic view of the system, and the way to do that is by analyzing the system at different molecular levels, if you can, and then uh, using informatics approach to integrate this data, and this will give us the, I mean, um, better view of the system and better understand of the disease if you want to study certain type of diseases. I think uh, the cis EQTLs and the trans EQTLs, they are not exclusive. Actually, a lot of times they are uh, the same or the connected. Let's think about a transcription factor. If there is a QTL in the promoter region of the transcription factor, it will be a cis EQTL because the um, S SNP in that region will affect the expression of the transcription factor itself. But because the transcription factor itself uh, alter the expression will change the activity of the transcription factor and then it will change a lot of downstream genes regulated by the transcription factor. In that way, uh, the SNP will also be a trans uh, EQTL. So and a lot of times and, uh, we can use a cis EQTL to identify the genes um, that are potentially important, but the trans EQTL can also tell us what is the downstream uh, regulatory network that this um, SNP is working on. So I think they are actually connected. It, they could be connected.
So I think that is actually a very fun part of our research. I think um, bioinformatics as a research area, one thing we're doing is to trying to develop algorithms and uh, methods in order to solve problems. But eventually what we want to do is to solve the biological problems. We want to make the biologists who don't have the ability to program, for example, to have access to the tools. So uh, a lot of efforts in my lab have been spent on this direction. So basically, uh, we develop web-based applications um, so that through very user-friendly interface, people can have access to a huge amount of data, and then they can also have um, appropriate tools that they can directly use to analyze those data. One example is a linked omics tool we recently published. Um, I think it has been used by, um, start, it has started to get many users from the cancer research community. Um, I th yeah, I think it's really interesting um, a part of the research to make your t tools or methods directly available to biologists. Actually, most of the uh, protein interaction network data we can have, or the protein interaction data we can have today in the public data repositories, I would think uh, most of them are the uh, static or more stable interaction relationship rather than the transient interaction relationships. Um, it's, I would hope that um, more experiments can be done in this area that can help us to identify the transient interactions and then condition specific interactions and then we can better annotate the network and the and interactions within the network and then we can use the right network to do, interpret our data in the right conditions. So I think it's not that we already have a lot of transient interactions in the data that but it's, I think we just have very few of those interactions and we need add more, but of course we need good annotations in the database to let people know um, about that so that they can identify the right interaction network for the specific condition they're interested in. I think the primary protein sequence can provide a lot of information that you can use to predict protein-protein interaction. Um, but the studies have shown that and only use that information, you won't be able to reach very high um, prediction accuracy. Um, leveraging other type of data can certainly improve the prediction accuracy. Um, and I also want to mention that the um, technology like the deep learning and this more in, uh, advanced uh, machine learning technologies that are available today because of the um, um, both the software and the hardware improvements now can enable us to better predict the protein interaction, for example, based on the primary sequence. But still, I mean, if we can incorporate more other types of data, you, that can certainly improve your uh, prediction accuracy. And especially when you want to predict the condition-specific interaction, uh, I don't think the primary sequence can give you a lot of information on that. And uh, for that part, specifically, you want to incorporate more information. That is true on um, most of the databases, even the protein-protein interaction database. And, um, the entities in those databases are actually genes. When we talk about protein-protein interaction in the protein interaction database, we are actually talking about the gene level data. Um, and uh, uh, I think the challenge is not the database itself is gene-centric, I think it's we just don't have enough information to distinguish the uh, function and the interaction and the characteristic of the individual protein isoforms. Uh, again, I think 
In the future, I hope the protein, uh, the databases can be protein isoform centric because different isoform can actually have very different functions. Um, but uh, in order to achieve that, and uh, for example, the uh, proteomics experiments, um, the sequence coverage has to be improved a lot because currently, um, if you do a, a mass spec based experiment, the sequence coverage is actually pretty low. It's less than 10% could be. Uh, and with that, you won't be able to very well distinguish the different protein isoforms. That's why the interpretation is usually done at, at the gene level. Um, it's not difficult to uh, convert the protein level data to gene level you, because it's aggregated to the gene level, right? But I think it's more difficult to get the detailed data at the protein isoform level and build database centered around the protein isoforms rather than genes. My name is Carsten Krug. I'm a computational scientist at the proteomics platform of the Pode Institute of MIT in Harvard. And I'm interested in how we can integrate large-scale data sets that have been acquired using different omics technologies. In a gene-centric analysis, we study the gene or the gene product itself, so meaning we want to compare its expression between two phenotypes. Let's say in the context of cancer, we want to know whether a gene is specifically upregulated in a cancer compared to a normal tissue, which uh, would probably or potentially introduce a new target for, for, this, for this specific cancer. If we study the entirety of all genes or gene products in the cell, we have to perform a statistical test which tells us which genes or proteins are st statistically significant between tumor and normal samples. And we would end up with long lists of differentially expressed genes which are sometimes very difficult to interpret. So in order to better understand what is happening in, in for example, tumors on a molecular level, we would usually or typically map these proteins or genes to pathways in order to better understand what is dysregulated in these tumors on a molecular level. Um, there's many different or several different databases that facilitate this kind of analysis. So there's the Reactome database, there's the CAG database, or also the uh, database of molecular signatures or MSIGDB. So um, if you ask me whether gene-centric analysis or pathway-centric uh, analysis uh, is better, um, so I personally think that both types of analysis are equally important. So sometimes a gene-centric analysis alone will probably, cannot give you the, the correct answer because the gene that you are interested in is probably not necessarily statistically significant or it's only like a marginal uh, case. But if you look at uh, like specific pathways and uh, several members of these pathways are going into the same direction in the tumor sample, for example, which, so this gives you more evidence that this pathway is regulated, for example. So we know that many, many mutations, millions of mutations have been associated to certain diseases and phenotypes. But only for a very few, we know actually the molecular consequences that are being introduced by these mutations. So if a mutation affects a coding region of a gene, uh, so it might be a non-synonymous, meaning it can introduce an amino acid change in the corresponding protein sequence. And if we think about post-translational modifications like phosphorylation of serine, threonine, and tyrosines, this can actually affect these, uh, uh, these phosphorylation sites. So serines, theonines, and tyrosines are actually very abundant in the human proteome, and therefore it's very likely that these amino acids are affected by mutations. So very, well, probably the simplest case of uh, uh, like the impact of a mutation of, on phosphorylation sites is that a phosphorylation site now gets mutated into a, a different amino acid, so meaning it cannot be phosphorylated anymore. And we, so it's very crucial to understand what kind of downstream effects these kind of, kinds of, uh, of events have. 
like in case a mutation affects a modified amino acid like a serine that is usually phosphorylated, now the serine is being mutated into a different uh, amino acid, it cannot uh, be phosphorylated anymore. So and it would, it's very crucial to understand what kind of downstream effects are introduced by these kinds of mutations. So this is probably the, the most uh, simplest form of, of such events. Other for, uh, forms of these events can uh, must not necessarily directly affect the PDM side, but they can be happening in very close proximity. And for example, in, in phosphorylation, we know uh, we, we very no, well know the, the enzymes that are uh, responsible for phosphorylation, kinases and phosphatases. Kinases, which are phosphorylating their substrates, are recognizing a very specific stretch of amino acid that surrounds the, uh, the PDM site. So this is one of many mechanisms how a kinase uh, uh, recognizes its substrates. So a kinase usually has uh, between uh, in a couple and a hundred substrate and so these amino acid stretches around these PDM sites is one mechanism how a kinase recognizes its substrate. So if a mutation now changes the amino acid composition of these uh, flanking sequences as we call them around these PDM site has direct effect on uh, the kinase substrate binding specificity. So it might happen that a phosphocyte that has been uh, more, uh, phosphorylated by a specific kinase like AKT1 for example uh, can now not be phosphorylated anymore by this particular kinase because it cannot recognize its substrate site anymore. So on the other hand or like another more complex example would be if uh, the kinase recognition motif now changes from a kinase A to kinase B. So uh, in the wild type form, the unmutated form, the, the phosphocyte was, uh, was phosphorylated by a certain kinase and now after the mutation the uh, kinase recognition motif fits better to another kinase which now can go and phosphorylate this phosphorylation site. So all of these events are probably not well understood as of now and I think it's very important to learn and to study uh, these kind of events more in detail. I think phosphorylation uh, by far is the best and most studied uh, post-translation modification to date because we have the methods uh, uh, to study these uh, phosphorylation on a large scale. There's other post-translation modifications like uh, ubiquitination or lysine acetylation, which now we also have the methods to study those uh, at, at large scale, also in patient samples. Of course, we can very easily study whether mutation affects directly these PDM sites, like whether these lysines are being replaced by another amino acid, and now uh, these uh, lysines cannot be ubiquitinated or acetylated anymore. But I think we still have very limited knowledge about specific binding motifs uh, for a lot of these acetyl transferases, uh, for example. So there are specific examples that uh, where we know the sequence motif, when we talk about uh, histone modifications, for example, but our knowledge is still very limited in this regard. I think what is very important uh, for a biologist is to be able to at least partially analyze their own data. So now biology has moved away from you know, a hypothesis driven, a very targeted type of analysis or experiments more to like a data driven omics type of experiment. So the, 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 the amount of data is uh, on a completely different scale compared to 10 years or 15 years back. So even as a wet lab uh, biologist, it's very important to be able to analyze your own data. So you need to have some computational skills. I think an easy way, I think, okay. I think an easy way to get started with any computational analysis or data science driven analysis are scripting languages like R or Python, for example. So both of these languages are very popular and very heavily used in data science in, in general, but also in computational biology in particular. I can only highly recommend any student who studies biology to get some skill set in R or Python.